So I, this is a, uh, I've cobbled together for this lecture a, um, a series of things that I want to talk with you about today. It's uh, in a sense coming from my own research obviously with my group, uh, which is a large group of collaborating scientists as well as postdocs and graduate students. But it's also a segment from what I teach normally, which is on Tuesdays and Thursdays I teach a course which is analogous to this, which would be at a 400, 500 level un senior undergraduates, graduate students. And it's, uh, it's called Earth System History. And I advertise it as from the origins of uh, elements to the evolution of intelligence in 26 lectures. So we wind up at the end of the day looking at FOXP2 genes and the evolution of speech and how I can horizontally transfer information to you, um, which is a very interesting problem in and of itself, obviously. So, um, <clears throat> but I'm going to talk today about light. So everybody in this room, uh, is a consumer, we're all basically carbon oxidizing agents. Uh, and we're extracting energy from uh, molecules that we didn't manufacture, which in fact we don't know how to manufacture very well. Uh, and that comes from a process which is somewhat still mysterious in a way. I'm not going to go into the details here of electron transfer reactions and photosynthesis. That's kind of not, I'm not trying to teach you the basics of photosynthesis. But I want you to understand the very simple phenomenon that somehow energy from our star is converted into chemical bond energy, which is the basis of life on this planet. Whether life began in a deep sea hydrothermal vent or in some little warm pond a la the letter that um, <coughs> Darwin wrote famously to Hook in uh, 1871, or somewhere else, at some point it appropriated a mode of living that is 99.999% based on photon energy conversion. The rest of life, which doesn't use photon energy conversion, to my knowledge, uses the gradient that was created by the photon energy conversion in the first place, such as in hydrothermal vents. So you have an oxidized ocean and a reduced fluid that's coming out of hydrothermal vents, and that redox gradient was set up because of the oxidation of the ocean about 2.4 billion years ago. Okay. So <clears throat> let's begin with at uh, the beginning. Um, I just want to give some acknowledgments to the people that work with me, most importantly. Uh, Dave Case, many of you may know him as a bioinorganic chemist uh, who is very famous for understanding redox regulation, especially of iron sulfur clusters. Jan is a bioinformatician. Um, Vic Nanda is a structural biologist. And then I'm going to be talking uh, about the work primarily of my former graduate student, John Kim, who's now doing a postdoc back in his uh, native Korea and R. Carell, who is a postdoc who is leaving back to Israel in a few months. All right, let's begin at the beginning, the origin of elements story. So this is a very old uh, story here. <coughs> Victor Goldschmidt spent his life uh, deriving this structure of the, uh, the elemental distributions in our neck of the galaxy. And of course, mo every one of you knows that beyond helium, the astronomers, for very, very bizarre reasons, call all these elements metals. So everything that is beyond helium is called a metal. All right. Now, the obvious two elements that are most abundant in a log scale normalized, by the way, to log six uh, for silicon in this representation, uh, hydrogen and helium were created by a big bang, we presume approximately 13.9 billion years ago. And that is where all of that elemental distribution came from, were those two. And then we come into classical system of cosmology, which you know far more about than I, but we had a very hot, very young star that was in this part of the solar system before this planet was formed, before our star was formed, that exploded. But it was very, very, very hot. And in the process of its nuclear generation of heat, it created all the rest of the elements that we see here. Uh, and then, of course, we have a lithium beryllium boron hole. If you're making lithium batteries, you're acutely aware of this because lithium is one of the most impoverished metals on the planet. Um, <clears throat> the lithium beryllium and boron disappear, basically, in the process of solar fusion at very high temperatures. They're very delicate, quote, delicate nuclear molecules. The, nu the nuclei of these atoms is very, relatively fragile. But once we escape from there, we come up to carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, and we can walk along and walk along. And 
Every one of you that has not seen this kind of plot before or is not familiar with it will obviously know right away from just looking at this that this modality of up, down, up, down, up, down is based on the Z number of the odd versus even number of protons. Okay? So if you have an even number of protons, it's a helium-helium fusion reaction with helium then combining with carbon, helium combining and so on to make oxygen. And the spolation or the loss or gain of a single proton and a single neutron to form the odd numbered uh, atoms is slightly less um, probable than the combination of helium. So you get this distribution of up, down, up, down. We have a few uh, interesting, and I'm not going to go into details here because I, I don't want to be a cosmologist with you, but, or a cosmochemist, but iron becomes the most, one of the most abundant um, metals that emerges. And then, of course, we go down. We're missing a few elements here. One, two, these two elements. Does anybody know why, the students? Why, why are we missing the two elements? Why aren't they here? Were they made? Protactinium, for example? Why, why don't we see it? Were they made? How many say yes, they were made? So what, where did they go? They're radioactive, they decay, and they no longer exist on a planetary surface that's four billion years old. Okay? Hi, Roger. All right. We have two major radioactive sources here, which give us the heat that drives this planet, uranium and thorium. There's one other. Does anybody know which other element is the really important one here? It's a much lighter element. Potassium. Potassium, Potassium what? Isotopic value? 40. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Potassium 40, uranium 238, 235, and thorium have decay series that lead to radiogenic heat on long periods of time. Now, <clears throat> these elements, those three elements, allow then a processing of the upper portion of this planet to be active. It's a viscous but still mobile mantle and crust, which regenerates a huge amount of or surplus of carbon, for example, and nitrogen ultimately uh, for, for life. Now, let's just talk about life. So life contains these big six elements, and we can arrange them in another way. They were arranged many times this way. And if you are Yiddish, you would say it's schnapps. <laughs> so schnapps, you know, is something in German or Yiddish, which is a little hard liquor that you would knock back. So that's what you can remember. But I've arranged them in their order of which they occur in the periodic table in terms of the Z number. All right, so let's just take a look at this. <clears throat> Why do I talk about these six? Why do we talk about these big six elements? Why are they the big six? The big six elements are the elements that make all the macromolecules that we see in life. So the macro, we're polymers. Basically, we're a combination of polymers. The polymers being protein, lipid, nucleic acid, and carbohydrate. Now, two of those polymers contain nitrogen. The number one sink for the polymer of nitrogen is protein, by far. It's about 1.4 nitrogens per unit mass of protein, um, <clears throat> on average. Um, proteins are the only other major sink for sulfur, by the way. There are only two amino acids that contain sulfur, methionine and cysteine. Amino, amino acids then contain nitrogen, and the nucleic acids contain nitrogen. Now, the nucleic acids contain one other element which is really critical, and that's phosphorus. And that's the only polymer which contains massive amounts of phosphorus. You can phosphorylate a protein, but that's a post-translational modification. It's, not, it's critical for regulation, but it's not critical for the synthesis of the protein. Um, <clears throat> You can put phosphates on sugar groups to make them more amenable to ma manipulation and intermediate metabolism. Now, phosphorus, unlike the other five of these elements, is the only element here that only obeys, in biology, acid-base chemistry. It does not undergo redox reactions. So just let's be very, very sure that we understand ourselves and that I'm not being confusing when, I understand, when I'm explaining what a redox reaction is. I don't want to get into a Nernst equation with you. It's not relevant for the, for the purposes. But a redox reaction is very simply put this way. 
It's a movement of an electron from one molecule or atom to another with or without a proton. With or without a proton. Acid-base chemistry is the movement of a proton without an electron. That's the difference, okay? Otherwise, they're set up in the world very similarly to each other in the equation sense. We talk about pKs, we talk about pHs. P, the P does the P in pH. What does the P stand for? Huh? Does anybody remember? It's the power, it's the power of hydrogen. So it's the log scale unit. That was the power, right? The power of hydrogen. All right, now, so let's talk about the other five now. So phosphorus becomes, for me, a very boring element. I'm taking it out of here for the moment because it's just an element that is linking things together in acid-base world. It does not transfer electrons. It can, it might have in the historical past, but once you get a small fugacity of oxygen, a little bit of oxygen on a planet, it's oxidized, and that's it. Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur are all doing a choreographed dance with each other in terms of moving electrons from one to another. Right? That's, that is the biology of life. That is the biology of life. Now they're aided in many cases by transition metals. So the first thing I want you to understand is I'm not talking about a metaphor. I'm talking about a reality here. Life is, this is not a metaphor. Life is electrical. The life that we know on this planet, all of it is based on an electrical gradient. So you have across your membrane of your cell, of every single cell in your body, an electrical field. Okay? Some of those electrical fields can be discharged in a very appropriate way for neuron firing, for example, for muscle firing. But most of those things have to be recharged right away, otherwise the cell dies. When a cell dies, it loses its electrical field. So the electrical field is a non-equilibrium condition that is set up as an emergent property of life. It has to have the field. The second thing, on a larger scale, all organisms have to derive the energy for the electrical field and for their own growth by moving electrons from a substrate to a product. So all, coupled rea all redox reactions are coupled. So it follows then biological processes are paired. And we can talk about this in a very simple way, and I'm going to talk about it in a simple way for a bit, because it's a very, very nice way to be non-threatening in terms of getting into molecular biobabble, okay? You're sitting here in the room. Some of us are breathing. Okay, so there's a vast amount of a reservoir of oxygen in the room which is not made locally. And you are exchanging gases with the environment. So two gases are coming out, important gases are coming out from our noses or mouths. They are, carbon dioxide is one, what's the other? Water, so water is reduced oxygen. You are putting the electrons from oxidizing the carbohydrate or the fat or the amino acids onto an oxygen molecule. Right? Where did the oxygen come from in the room? Where did the oxygen come from in the room? No. Or on the planet? Well, the in general. Yeah. But where's the source of the oxygen? Water. 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 We are living on a planet that is a global water water cycle. Okay, it's a water-water cycle. Now you're deriving energy because the potential of using the energy, the electrical gradient between mm -hmm. the oxygen in the room and the mm -hmm. carbohydrate or whatever it is you're metabolizing is high, you're deriving energy. So this is an exothermic reaction, right? A small fraction of that energy is used for heat, for your bodies, but a larger fraction is used for other things to burn metabolism, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you and I being mammals, we're hummers in the room, okay? I mean, compared to a uh, Prius, which would be something like a crocodile. <laughs> so you and I use huge amounts of fuel, about eight times more than a crocodile. But still, that's the reaction, where both of us, the crocodile and us, are using that electrical gradient, the redox gradient. Now, prior to the evolution of oxygen, there was life on this planet. We only got oxygen about 2.4 billion years ago. So what was the electron marketplace in the Archean, which is 
a long period of time ago, right? So we're talking about up until about 2.5 billion years. Well, it was certainly, probably, originally, very much based on that molecule, hydrogen gas itself, <coughs> which has several sources possible. One is the lithosphere. This molecule here, which is, once it rusted out in the presence of oxygen, um, just precipitates. So ferrous iron was a source potentially of electrons, but not of the proton. Okay. H2S, there's a nice rich source of electrons and protons, and of course carbohydrates themselves. <coughs> so here are rocks that are oxidized from 3.8 billion years ago. I'm just going to leave that with you for a minute. This is a, the issue of formation, the top of it, in Greenland. And there's a scale bar. Okay. <laughs> Today, as I just told you, the source is hydrogen. I mean, the source of hydrogen is primarily uh, water. Now, I want to make something very, very clear. Um, in the evolution of nanomachines, organisms don't split water. Photosynthesis doesn't split water into hydrogen gas and oxygen. Okay? We wouldn't be here if that were the case. This is what biological systems do and what you do in your body. A photon comes into this machine, whatever it is, and it pops an electron off a chlorophyll molecule. The electron goes to a very electron negative place and then is moved downhill to some other carriers so that it doesn't back react. All right, I've got an oxidized chlorophyll molecule. Oxidized chlorophyll molecules are not a happy camper. They search around, where can I get another electron? I want to get that electron back. Oh, there's a tyrosine sitting in my protein. Boop! Pop an electron off a of tyrosine. The tyrosine now is an unhappy camper. It looks around, where do I get an electron? Oh, there's a couple of manganese atoms sitting right out here. I pop an electron off a of manganese atom. The manganese atom now says, oh, I am missing an electron. Where do I get an electron from? and sees a water molecule. Now the water molecules drip in here like a straw, like a little stream through a straw. One at a time. One photon, one electron, one photon, one electron. Four times until you generate an O2. So the O2 is finally released, but the electrons went through this electron carrier system. The protons didn't. The protons are deposited on this side of the membrane making this side of the membrane three pH units more acidic than that side of the membrane. Three pH units more acidic. A thousand times more protons on one side of the membrane than the other. There's an electrical field. That's a huge electrical field. When this was discovered, at first this wasn't discovered by Peter Mitchell. This actually was discovered by Andre Jägendorf, who should have shared the Nobel Prize, but didn't with Mitchell. But this phenomenon was one of the very first phenomena of the experimental proof of how we make ATP. So what happens? These protons move over to this machine, which we do not understand the origin of very well. It's an ATP, it's a coupling factor, and it literally turns. It literally, as these protons spin through here, this machine literally turns. Okay? So the bottom of the machine turns, okay? This, this rotor shaft that sits inside the memory. And the protons emerge up the other side. Now I'm just going to finish this story for a second because I want you to understand when we're talking about nanomachines in life, I'm not talking about something that is again a metaphor. It is truly a machine. Mm -hmm. So it's turning and there's a, another series of proteins that comes down the side of this head that sits in the membrane here. It's called a stator and it prevents the top of this from turning. Now I'm going to do an interpretive dance for you of an ATPase. As this machine turns around on the bottom, the head group is going like this. Okay, it's wobbling. Every 120 degrees of the turn, an ATP is formed. Um, actually, Carplus just down the road at Harvard, that other school. Um, he has worked a lot on this machine. 
I want to finish up on these two little machines here for a second. These are both photosynthetic machines. They come from two different organisms, probably. Uh, they have very similar structures, but totally different sequences. And, and these machi this machine finally takes the electron, moves it up to a higher, even more electronegative place. And the electron, which wound up over here in ferrodoxin, a little molecule which I'll talk to you about in a little bit uh, more, finally couples up with its proton to make this molecule NAD or pH. Okay, in this case it's NADPH. Now why is that? The NADPH is the carrier of hydrogen in living cells for the most part. There are a few others, but that's the main carrier. Why didn't we just make the hydrogen to begin with? What would have happened if we'd made the hydrogen? Why not just put the water and make the hydrogen? Why go through all this gobbledygook? You know what would have happened? Not only wouldn't you have an electrical gradient, it would have escaped. It would have just diffused out of the cell so quickly the cell couldn't get a handle on it, couldn't do very much with it. Cells that make hydrogen are doing something else for our metabolism. All right, these final, last two things, last one thing here, this machinery. Inside this reaction center, it's called, inside this reaction center, we've made this charge separation between this chlorophyll that is now oxidized and another molecule of it doesn't matter, that's got an electrical negative charge, positive, negative. This is about 100 angstroms across. There's a little volume inside here. This little machine has such a high charge density, it's about 3,000 volts per cubic angstrom. It's almost like a lightning bolt is in there. That machine has got such an electrostatic interaction, it does that. Under this oxidation reduction, it does that. Again, I'm not a metaphor. It literally collapses on itself and when it does that, it emits an acoustic wave. It's called a photoacoustic effect. Both machines will do that. It's one of the very, very few examples in biophysics where you can show the interaction where the acoustic wave is directly proportional to the energy conserved in the system. So the maximum energy conservation here is 45%. 45%. That's pretty high energy conservation efficiency. What happens to the rest of the energy? 3% goes to fluorescence. The other rest of it, the rest of the rest, it all goes to heat. This one is 85% efficient. Very little of it goes to heat and none of it goes to fluorescence at room temperature. <clears throat> now, that machinery, which contains about 120 individual evolved and self-assembled units in genes, evolved once, once. And it evolved, as far as we can tell, once. This machine, by the way, is in your mitochondria as well. This machinery is slightly modified from a mitochondria, but it's in your mitochondria and my mitochondria. It evolved in these guys, cyanobacteria. Now, when I say it evolved once, I mean it literally from a cyanobacterium that is approximately two and a half billion years old, maybe older, I don't know where Roger is on this now, to present day, the protein sequence of that D1 protein in the reaction center, this one here, diffuse band one, is 86% identical to the higher land plants that evolved 20 million years ago. 86% identical. And yet, every 10,000 turnovers, every 10,000 claps, that D1 protein is destroyed. None of the other proteins is, are destroyed, only the D1 protein. It has to be replaced. So nature, like Microsoft, rather than inventing a new program code, <laughs> developed an elaborate repair system. Now, a few years ago with my colleagues, Tom Fenchel, who is in Denmark, and Ed DeLong, who is or was here at MIT, we wrote a, a it wasn't really a review paper, although it was a, a contributed as a review paper. We wrote a paper that try to wire the diagram of life, of all of life. So all of the important electron transfers across the globe are envisioned in this diagram, which is hard to, hard to gather for a bit. But basically we have 
electron transfer reactions that are generated by photon energy here, and electron sink reactions and recycling reactions that are up here, respiration. Normally, most of the reactions up here, most of the reactions are anaerobic. By the time we get to oxygenic photosynthesis and the evolution of aerobes, it, metabolism gets very boring. We are very, very, very limited organisms. I hate to say it, you know, plants and animals are very limited organisms. The repertoire of microbial uh, metabolism is much, much, much greater than for us. And we can put this into a, a more logical scheme of various types of metabolism. But the point is this, and I'm not going to go, this is kind of a, you know, what, what, who's, who's associated with what. Um, <coughs> Here's the point. That sort of keg map, the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Gene and Genome type of map of metabolism of the planet, only requires about 500 genes, actually less. All of metabolism across this planet is dependent on very, very, very few catalysts. Now, how are the electrons connected? So I envision the planet in a very simple way. Being at MIT, I think you're all comfortable with this. <laughs> So you have a power supply, the sun. You have a series of literal transducers on the planet that are acting like transistors, local transistors. So you and I are, in effect, a local transistor on this circuit board. And now we need some wires. What are the wires? We have two major wires, two, the atmosphere and the ocean. They are carrying the electrons across the planet. So, the electrical field is dissipated from local production to local consumptions all across the planet because of only those two geophysical fluids. If you lost either one or both of those geophysical fluids, life becomes a very, very different phenomenon. So if we found a bug on Mars with a very, very thin atmosphere and no geophysical fluid that we can see, it's obvious that's liquid, it's a very lonely critter. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the structure of the transistors and how they evolved. First, if you look across the transistors that move electrons, and that's what I'm talking about in biology, they're called enzyme commission one proteins. Enzyme commission ones are the oxidoreductases. Those are the catalysts that catalyze reactions involving electrons with or without protons. For those of you who remember basic biochemistry, there are six enzyme commission groups, the major classification, enzyme commission one. So you all know one. One enzyme commission, one point, one point, there are four numbers, one point, one point, one point, one is alcohol dehydrogenase. Okay, for example, one of the very first to be purified. Over 60%, almost 70%, of the oxidoreductases that have metals, not all of them have metals, but most of them have metals, contain one metal in the form of either a heme or an iron or an iron sulfur cluster. Copper is the second most abundant of these elements that's used in oxidoreduction and followed to a much lesser extent by manganese, nickel, molybdenum, and so on. Now, if you want to know this in detail, Please read the Baccarian lecture by R.J.P. Williams, the Baccarian lecture in 1981 called The Natural Selection of the Chemical Elements. It is one of the most beautiful essays that I have ever read in my life. It is really, uh, Bob Williams was an amazing, well, he's still alive, but he's not working anymore. He's 90 years old. But he, he was an amazing person and uh, just, just phenomenal. So when we talk about molybdenum, the electron transfers to and from molybdenum involve one of the big six elements almost all the time. What does it, which one? Does anybody know? Huh? Mm. No, good guess though. It's nitrogen. The electrochemistry of molybdenum is matched in most of the cases to nitrogen. If you see an enzyme that has molybdenum in it, it's probably doing something with nitrogen. Manganese matched mostly to oxygen. Copper matched mostly to sulfur and to, in some cases, to, in our case, very specifically, the terminal electron uh, donator contains uh, in, our, in us uh, copper. Iron is very, very, very promiscuous. It can be found all over the place. It can be found in nitrogen reduction. It can be found in many, many, many oxidoreductions. 
The efficiencies, though, depend very widely. And so that's why, some, in some cases, it's not just based on availability. It's just based on efficiencies that they've been replaced by molybdenum or other, other trace metals. Now, I'm going to talk about the evolution of sequences in folds in proteins. A fold is the way a protein is, is turned or is, well, you'll see in a minute. So um, sequences you all know intuitively. A sequence is a linear sequence of amino acids. So there are a certain set of what we went to search for of what we call core structural motifs. These are what, what, what made the transistors work. How many transistor types are there on the circuit board? We know the power supply. We know the wiring diagram. How many transistors did nature make? How many different kinds? And I want to just point out that there's a very, very, very interesting paper that was uh, written in, at one point by Margaret Dayhoff, who died, unfortunately. Margaret Dayhoff was the mother, the grandmother of bioinformatics. She wrote this paper in 1966, and she wrote this. The processes of natural selection severely inhibit any change in a well-adapted system on which several other ancestral components depend. So what does that mean? It means the D1 protein sequence hasn't changed from a cyanobacteria to a higher plant because it is the, the whole machine is dependent on the D1. Nitrogenase hasn't changed. The core machines have not changed. That's not where evolution is really working to make things big time, okay? So these core machines should be very, very highly conserved. Now let's take a look at one of them. This is Margaret Dayhoff's favorite machine, ferrodoxin. Ferrodoxin sat up there at the top of photosystem 2 and accepted that electron. That's really, and, and then it donated the electron to NADPH. Ferrodoxin originally, Margaret Dayhoff saw by inspection it's a 56 amino acid sequence. She realized immediately in 1966 that <coughs> it was a dimer. It had to have come from a gene duplication event. So the original monomer was 28 amino acids or less. It contains already in the 28 amino acids four iron, four sulfur cluster. Now the fold here is a very interesting fold. It's a very classical fold. It's got a cysteine, X, X, cysteine, X, X, cysteine, variable amounts, and then a final terminal cysteine. The four cysteines wrap themselves around and hold the lig uh, they are the ligands for the iron sulfur cluster. This is nature's hydrogen sulfide in a biological sense. Okay? So it's the sulfur atoms of the cysteine that are coordinating to the iron sulfur cluster. The redox potential of this molecule can be changed by altering the X's. The only X that's not found in nature is proline. Now, one last thing. The iron sulfur cluster is not chiral. It's perfectly symmetrical. I could have made an iron sulfur cluster that was grabbed this way with the cysteines or grabbed this way with the cysteines. Every single iron sulfur cluster in nature that we know of is this, right-handed. So the emergence of chirality had to have occurred prior to the emergence of the extant molecule of the protein. Second, the reason for it is very simple. It could have gone either way. If we substitute D-amino acids in this structure versus L-amino acids, there's one less hydrogen bond to the iron sulfur cluster. The stability is just made up the difference of one single hydrogen bond, making the D-amino acids less favored than the L-amino acids in the present configuration. Now you can take a much, much more complex molecule 38 irons, but all in iron sulfur clusters. This is nitrogenase. This is the core of the nitrogenase system here. Again, more, this is one molybdenum atom in the modern one, which we have a good structural analysis for. We have very, very good structural analysis for this. Now, all I'm pointing out to you here, and it's very hard to see, but there are very similar folds from 
iron or sulfur cluster that you would see in the ferrodoxin. That's number one. But number two, while we're here, and now we're looking at a larger molecule, I want you to notice two things. You see this? This is called a helix. This structure here is called the sheet, and this structure here is called the loop. Those are the three different secondary structures in protein structural biology. This is a very simple analysis, I want you. Three is all you need to know. The loop contains many amino acids that don't interact with each other very much. It's called an intrinsically disordered protein, generally. It's the most highly evolvable. It's the least stiff, okay? And you'll see that in a bit. Now here's a structure with lots of sheets. It's superoxide dismutase and it contains copper. You can make another superoxide dismutase which contains manganese. There are four basic superoxide dismutases. The manganese and the iron-based ones come from the same family. The copper-based ones and the nickel-based ones evolved independently. They came from different fold groups to have the same function. So, there appear to be only 35 motifs across the tree of life. Now, what I'm talking about, 35 motifs, I don't care what the organism is. There are only 35 transistors on the board. 35 transistors on the board, two wires, one power supply. It shouldn't be that hard to figure out how this works, right? <clears throat> so here's what we try to do. Here are the 35 motifs. You can read it for yourself. That's what we call the gold standard. A little bit pretentious, but that's what structural biologists did. Now here's, here's, a, here's when you see a smart, a smart graduate student. Now we have a lot of ways that we can look at how proteins interact with each other in terms of their, their structural similarities. We have top match, we have a lot of algorithms that look at, at protein structures. At Rutgers we have the protein data bank in the chemistry department and that's what a lot of the people do is they try to look for structural, topology uh, is very, very hard to do as you know in mathematics. So when you have complex structures saying how, how close is that to this guy, it's hard to do. But, we can lay these structures out in a simple way. We can say, okay, I'm going to take, and we can do a lot of sensitivity analysis. You can read the paper, or maybe you did, or maybe you don't want to. Anyway, you can go to a center of the metal cluster and walk out 15 angstroms in every direction to make a sphere. If you walk out 20, you can do that. If you walk out 10, it's not enough. If you walk out 25, then you're starting to get into other parts of a fold, which you don't want. So 15 angstroms is what we took as a very simple value. And then you can go into and look at and analyze exactly how much protein fold there is that is a loop, a helix, or a sheet. Okay, you're just classifying it in three places. And you're going to make a triangle in two-dimensional space. And every protein, now you will put and assign in a vector space according to whether it's a loop, 100% loop, 100% sheet or 100% helix. Okay? And you can then fold this sheet or crinkle it up according to the number of hydrogen bonds that are in the fold. So let's take a look at how this works out. If we have very few hydrogen bonds in the fold, you come up into this part of the world, which is the in intrinsically disordered protein, okay? No extant protein fits right up there now in EC1 land that we know of. You can come down to these beta barrels or these very stiff molecules down here, the helices like hemes. Huge amounts of uh, much, much more energy is expended to creating a stiffer protein in hydrogen bond. What does that mean? And you will know this immediately because I'm going to give you a very simple example. You're breathing now oxygen, right? Uncharged molecule, linear molecule, very simple molecule, diatomic molecule. If I substitute a carbon for one of the oxygens and I make it carbon monoxide, and you breathe carbon monoxide, what happens? You die. That's because your cytochrome oxidase is irreversibly poisoned by a gas that looks almost exactly like O2, but is only substituted by one atom that is two mass units lower in terms of proton. Very similar. 
That's because that, that molecule, that iron copper molecule in cytochrome oxygen is very, very stiff. Let's go up here. Nitrogenase is sitting up in this world. I can take nitrogen gas and fix it to N2 to ammonia, right? But it'll also fix acetylene. It'll fix anything that will fit into the active site. It's a promiscuous molecule. It's because it has far less hydrogen bond energy in the fold. So things that were here almost certainly evolved to be things that were there. Much, much more specialized. Much less promiscuous in terms of what it would accept as a substrate. So we're looking up here for the origin of the EC1s. Now, oh, let me go back one step. From this, one can draw a vector to every single other one of these points on this Euclidean space and derive with a very simple Bayesian, a very simple Bayesian prior, that <coughs> We can derive a phylogeny, if you will, of these transistors by structure. A phylogeny from topology, not by sequence. Why do we want to do it by structure and not sequence? There's so many sequences that have been altered with retaining the same structures, right? So. So what do we have back here? Well, we have our old friend ferrodoxin, just down at the base, but we have an iron hydrogenase. This is one of the very first proteins here. This is an enzyme that can split hydrogen into an electron and proton. Sounds like a very simple task, but once you do that, you have a way of synthesizing a carbon fixation pathway under anaerobic conditions, right? You just need a lot of that gas. Then we come to a nitrite, sulfite, reductase, terpsirohemes, and then these are all still, I don't know if you can read this, this is all in the loop clade. What's very interesting for me here is we get to these very early molecules, at least in, I can't tell time here exactly, obviously, but we get to molecules that evolved apparently relatively early to have molybdenum, which is very interesting problem. And then we come down here to our, our sheet clades, and we can see a bunch of proteins. Some of them you are familiar with, maybe like superoxide dismutase. And then we come over to here to our helix clade, and you can see one of the last evolving enzymes in terms of structure on this chart is the cytochrome C oxidase, which we have for, oxidize, or for reducing uh, water, okay, or accepting oxygen. And then we see nitrogenase evolve very early back here. Now, do I believe this? No. I think it's a very good guidepost. What I think is missing here is obviously the phylogeny of proteins like this probably was not monophyletic. N monophyletic. It didn't come from a single ancestral protein. So to do that analysis, we, were, we worked on something else, which I'm not going to show you today, because out of limitations of time, we can discuss. And that's using a network approach. Rather than using sequences directly, we use sequences in a network approach. And it would appear that we have 10 independent origins of the EC1 proteins for the last 4 billion years, or however long life has existed on this planet. There are some patterns here which I don't quite see. This is the same tree, and these are the different types of, pro of, of metals that have been uh, appropriated to the various proteins. <clears throat> Obviously, hemes probably came in fairly early, which is a very interesting phenomenon, and hemes probably did evolve very early. Um, the reason that hemes are so critical, of course, is that hemes, once you make a heme, you can very, very, very easily dial in light acceptance and tune it because you can control with side groups the what the heme sees and you can control the redox chemistry very precisely, much, much more readily than controlling iron sulfur clusters. The, rep <coughs> the repertoire of metabolisms that are allowed with hemes seems to be much, much greater than with iron or iron sulfur clusters by themselves. So how many 
there are thousands of hemes. But I mean, in, in true nature, there are probably around 20 major hemes. Cytochromes, for example, all cytochromes contain hemes. Um, heme comes to us from pathways that are relatively simple. Uh, Sam, Sam Granick worked on this for many, many years at the Rockefeller. And there's a major distinction between plant and animal hemes? Or? No. I mean, uh, well, the chlorins are, are chlorophylls. They're, they're not true hemes, but they're very similar in their, in their uh, formation to hemes. We have two pathways that lead to the evolution of hemes in modern biochemistry. They're, they come from two different ways. The way a plant makes a heme and the way we make a heme, the starting materials are different. Now, I'm going to end this with the light story. So that's the top-down approach to understanding how we make the transistors. Now I'm going to go through the bottom-up approach very quickly. This is a work in progress, and I hope it's a work that's going to be more in progress as we move. But this is an old paper now. It's a year old. And um, if you start to look around at minerals, minerals have absorption spectra that are somewhat well-known, depends. Um, and from absorption spectra, you can calculate the distribution of electrons across the mineral surface using density functional theory. So that is a very straightforward approach to theoretical calculation of whether or not a mineral will act or interact with photons at wavelengths that are reasonable. By wavelengths that are reasonable, I'm not talking about x-rays. Okay. So, this mineral here is siderite. It's a very simple mineral. It's iron carbonate. We make it under anaerobic conditions, very, very strictly anaerobic conditions. My colleague Nathan Yee has worked on this molecule for a long time. Um, and we keep it in aqueous phase under anaerobic conditions. And this is a quartz cuvette. So this is just showing you how this is set up. We isolate out of the... Uh, uh, a halogen, in this, in this case xenon arc lamp, we isolate specific bandwidths of radiation. Now the density functional theory predicts an antibonding orbital, that means an electron can be removed from this molecule of iron carbonate at approximately 4.8 electron volts, which corresponds to about 270 nanometers of light, which is in the ultraviolet. So, <clears throat> I think it doesn't take too much glimpsing here to realize that this has been somehow changed in color from the background, where the, we, we did this without stirring to show you this effect. So this is oxidized iron. Fe2 went to Fe3. This is Fe2, this is Fe3. So the photon energy removed, just the photon energy removed an electron, okay? from a mineral. So if you're a chemist, the first thing you ask is where did the electron go, right? Like, duh. And by the by, <coughs> the product ultimately becomes magnetic. So I'm not going to go into that. It was published. The product, the first product that we see is this, H2 gas. We're generating hydrogen gas from the photochemical reaction of iron 2 with ultraviolet light. And the reaction is actually very complicated. Uh, it took me a long time to work this out. I worked this out, thankfully, with Fraser Armstrong, who's a much better inorganic chemist than I am. He's actually one of the best in the world. He's at Oxford. Um, so iron 2 is hit by a photon. We generate a very funny speciation here. You make an iron 3, but this is reverted to an iron 1, we think. We're pretty sure. The iron one generates a proton, and we continue on this process. It's a two-photon reaction, ultimately generating two ferric irons, which are hydroxides, okay, which precipitate. Um, and we know it's a two-photon reaction because this is the production in uh, rate of micromoles per day, and this is the effect of flux, and that's not linear. Okay? The quantum yield is not a constant in this plot. The quantum yield is a function of flux. This obeys a e to the 2 power. It's 2.01, so two photons. Two photon reaction. Now, you know, we can do some hocus pocus here. I, I don't really need to, to 
belabor the point. If we just assume that this reaction can occur in a primordial atmosphere down to a depth of about 100 meters in the water column, we generate a hydrogen flux that, from siderite oxidation that's on the order of about 3 or 4 times 10 to the 11th moles per year. It's comparable to, but distributed over a lot much, comparable to a serpentinization reaction or sub aerial volcanoes at the time, but obviously it's potentially distributed over a, a larger area. I'm not pointing out siderite. I don't want to worry about siderite. I'm pretty sure that siderite oxidation occurred on Mars. No, it's the surface chemistry. Just surface. You just, just need it on a surface. You're just going to replenish it. All I'm pointing out to you is there are many other potential photochemical reacting minerals. Now, obviously, the ones that I'm interested in will contain manganese. Now, there's one mineral which is called marakite, which is a very, very rare mineral, but it is found, which contains four manganese atoms in a cluster. Our very earliest experiments suggest that that in aqueous anaerobic phase can generate oxygen gas. <coughs> now, is that the origin of photosystem II reaction center? I don't know. But it certainly poses the question, how many elements out there in mineral form, inorganic form, were used to convert photochemical energy to electrical energy, in this case, and chemical bond energy in the form of H2, or other molecules prior to the existence of true biological ligands. And I don't know. I mean, obviously, there were many, many minerals that were available in the late Hadean and early Archean. Some of them are totally uninteresting to me, even though we know very well that they're photoreactive. Rutile, titanium dioxide, is a is very well known photoreactive me mineral. I'm not. There, we don't use titanium in biology, so I'm not really that keen about it. Molybdenum disulfide, on the other hand, is a very interesting mineral. So molybdenum disulfide can be photooxidized. And when you do that, you do something very cool. You can make molybdenum soluble, albeit transiently, even under anaerobic conditions or anoxic conditions. So was the availability of molybdenum really a limiting factor in the early Archean? I don't think so. I think that nice clean story that Anbar and Noel told, which I like, uh, that we have this separation of solubility factors based solely on the oxidation state of the oceans negates the interacting chemistries of photons with mineral phases, especially in the upper ocean. So I'm going to leave you there. I, um, I'm going to show this. I didn't know that. This is siderite. And obviously siderite can be oxidized and carbonate would be lost. I don't know, was it a form of the banded iron formations? Was it responsible for some of this? I don't know. So let's go back. So during the first two and a half billion years of Earth's history, nature invested in a research and development phase. Okay, that's, that's the Silicon Valley time. You had a lot of young actors on the stage, fearless, let's try things out, see what works. Okay, a lot of things got culled. From which a very small core set of, t of nanomachines evolved roughly 35 transistors in this case. Even not even that many, probably. All of the key processes were developed in prokaryotes. Eukaryotes did not invent a damn thing. Okay, I, you know, we're, as one eukaryote talking to another, I'm sorry, but <laughs> we're, we're just not that interesting. Okay. There are approximately 500 core genes that make the biological electrons go around. That, now that core genes, what I'm saying, the 35 transistors have to be coupled up to other things. They, just, they don't operate in vacuo. Okay, so the, 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 this is all you need to make an organism, or less. These metabolic sequences are coupled on planetary scales, and the electrical potential is driven by light. Um, and there goes the sun. So, thank you very, very much. I'm very happy to... Thank you. Let's start with some questions. I'm sure there might be a lot.
Please okay. feel free. I have to ask this because it was posted in the elevator that you were going to talk about the nitrogen economy or the oxygen economy. Yeah. You could do it just in one minute. Yeah. Just so you, I know what you're talking. About. So, <clears throat> so the nitrogen cycle on the planet is driven totally by biology uh, to first order. I mean, we do have small reactions of lightning with nitrogen, but on the scale of of a biological processes, nitrogen, fixed nitrogen enters the planetary atmosphere from this reaction, which is N2 gas goes to ammonia because of nitrate reduction by one enzyme nitrogenase. That's the second enzyme I showed you with the 38 irons and, and sulfurs. So this is a reduction. And then, in the presence and only in the presence of oxygen, only in the presence of molecular O2, as far as we know, as far as I know. Ammonium can be oxidized to nitrite and then nitrate. Now, as I say, microbes don't do that out of the goodness of their little microbial hearts. They do it because they're getting the electrons and protons in the beginning from um, ammonium and using that to fix carbon in without light energy. Right? So that is chemoautotrophy. Okay. Now, in the absence of, so this is oxidation. In the absence of, of a lot of oxygen, when you get to about five micromolar oxygen or less, many, many microbes, this is, this is very catalyzed very specifically by two sets of microbes. Not anybody, just anybody off the street can do that. But a lot of microbes off the street can do this. They can dump their electrons on nitrate if oxygen is not available and oxidize organic matter. Ultimately, you can go through, you may go through laughing gas or nitric oxide, but at the end of the day, you wind up with, ammonia, uh, with nitrogen N2, okay? All right, so now, This is what inspired me. I was looking down through the Black Sea, so this is concentration. I'm just going to write concentration here. And this is depth, so this is about 150 meters. <clears throat> so this is oxygen. And this is hydrogen sulfide. And then it will go down to the, the, sea, the bottom of the, the Black Sea at a couple thousand meters. It will just flatten out. It will turn around. This just just few. But this is you see that, right? So this is anaerobic, this is aerobic. All right, can I erase this now for a second so I can put up more species? Okay. So <clears throat> this is nitrate concentrations in the upper portion of the Black Sea. And it, this is the ammonium. There's very little nitrogen fixed in the Black Sea. What's mostly happening is the ammonium is diffusing up, and it gets into an area where there's enough oxygen to allow it to be converted to nitrate. OK? Fine. And then here is a very curious So. <clears throat> The nitrate that is uh, very high up in the water column is consumed by primary producers, phytoplankton. And they sink ultimately into the anaerobic deep waters where their ammonium is, is regenerated. Okay, so there's no oxygen down there, you can't make nitrate. So you diffuse it up, you make a little nitrate, or nitrate is made uh, in the upper portion of the water column, but some of that nitrate can goes diffuses down. And here you find these funny organisms that denitrify, and they produce N2 gas in excess of that which would be soluble. Now let's look at this for a minute. There's a node here where there's virtually no fixed nitrogen. 
because the ammonium that was produced in the presence of a small amount of oxygen is consumed almost as quickly as it's produced. So there's nitrate is, is denitrified very, very extensively in that, that little zone, right? You, you with me so far? So what I did was I turned this on its side and I said this was time. And this is the Archean Ocean. This is an ocean without oxygen. And now as we start to make oxygen, I'm going to make a little bit of nitrate. But as I make nitrate, I'm going to denitrify the ocean. So the feedback is a negative feedback of keeping to pushing the system back into that portion of the world. I worked on this with, with Mick quite a, quite a bit, actually. Um, and then, of course, at some point, we blew through that and we got to this stable world where nitrate actually is, is abundant in the world ocean. I just make it in time, it would have been like this, right? So nitrate becomes the same. So what I'm saying in that portion of the, the descriptor was that, um, so this is a model and we, we try to test this using nitrogen isotopes because if you just fix nitrogen from the atmosphere and don't do anything with it, the fractionation of N14 and N15 is virtually nil because nitrogen fixation imposes a very small isotopic fractionation on atmospheric nitrogen. And that's the reference nitrogen. Uh, but as we make nitrate and then oxidize, I mean reduce the nitrate to N2 gas, we blow off the light isotope from the at uh, to the atmosphere and you're remaining with heavier isotope in the organic matter. So what we would see here then are several attempts in the late Archean to make heavy isotope, plus 8, plus 10 per mil in the kerogen, which suggests that nature tried several times to get to an oxidizing atmosphere before the so-called great oxidation event that we see from the sulfur isotopic fractionations. That was the idea. Okay, sorry it was a long-winded answer. More questions here? Yes, I was wondering what, what would happen in a planet where all these metals were more readily, readily available? More readily available? Yes. For example, the planet is not, is not well differentiated. You want to allow water on the planet? So, in that case, I don't think much different would happen. The reason is, I don't think iron was very limiting for a very, very, very long time. I mean, it was the most available metal, probably at concentrations on order of hundreds or at least tens of nanomolar. Um, <coughs> molybdenum itself, even in the Archean, probably was about 10 to the minus eighth molar. Uh, I don't think they were very, they were very often limiting, if ever. Not like in the modern world. I think once you oxidize a planet, then you get into significant uh, places where iron is limiting. So we have three major places where we know iron is limiting directly for prime production. And I would uh, postulate, I have postulated, I've tried to test this, but it's about a hundred million dollar experiment. Somehow they don't just pull that out of the back of their pockets down in Washington, but iron is probably limiting nitrogen fixation in the global ocean today, in the tropics. So in addition to iron being limiting in the subarctic Pacific and the eastern equatorial Pacific and in the Antarctic oceans for primary producers, I think a large section of the, of the, of the Pacific is iron limited. Um, and why, why do I say that? What's the evidence, Paul? Well, okay. How many of you took a basic oceanography course and know the red field ratios? Okay, so red field ratios. What, what is the red field ratio of N to P? 16 to 1. Serge. So why is it 16 to 1? What makes it 16 to 1? You shush. Why is it 16 to 1? What is the P? Where's the P? Where's P in a, in a microbe? Which, which unit? It's in the nucleic acids, yes. Which unit? 
No, it's not ATP. It's not DNA. It's ribosomal RNA. 80% of the phosphate in a microbe is in ribosomes. Okay, just think about that for a second. Ribosomes. Where's the N? 80% of the N is in protein, right? What do ribosomes do? They make protein, right? So you have the car factory and you have the cars. And they're in a pretty constant fixed value of 16 to 1. So that is the red field ratio. So you cannot, any ratio differing from that is not red fieldian. So if it's 15 to 1, it's not red field ratio. It's 16 to 1. Now, there's a very famous paper. Redfield wrote in the American Journal of Science, 1958, on what, he first wrote the paper in 1932. He had one idea that he kept rewriting the paper on. Okay, he got a lot of mileage on it. 1958, he wrote a very interesting paper and he said, look, in the ocean interior, the soluble nitrate to phosphate is not 16. It's 15, closer to 15. But yet the sinking flux appears to be 16 to 1. But then he went down the street. He was at Woods Hole, the director at Woods Hole. He went down, the, he didn't have many biologists to talk to at Woods Hole. They were all these, you know, physical chemical guys, mostly, and bio light. He went down the street to a very famous ecologist at Yale, Evelyn Hutchinson, and he said, what's going on here? And Hutchinson looked at him, he said, well, phosphorus has to be limiting because there's no other source for phosphorus except rock supply, weathering, through riverine flow into the ocean. We don't have any aeolian flux of it and it cannot be fixed. Yet biological processes can fix nitrogen and it's super abundant in the atmosphere. It's the most abundant gas by far. Shouldn't be a problem. So you go into the Woese data sets, any data set you want, and you'll write an N to P ratio. Okay, what's the N to P ratio as a function of depth? And I'll make it to say four kilometers. And the N to P ratio is a function of depth and this is going to be 16 to 1. So that's the red field ratio right there, okay? And you have now thousands of data points, thousands and thousands of very high precision data points. Okay. In every single ocean basin, major, the Indian, the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean has an entropy ratio of 14.32 below a thousand meters. 14.32. The Pacific is 14.71 on average, below a thousand meters. The Atlantic is 15.2 approximately, below a thousand meters. Why? Now, with the sole exception of the Atlantic Ocean, every single ocean basin when you get to the surface has entropy ratios that go to this way. They get lower and lower and lower. N, to N becomes much more limiting than P. The Atlantic is the only ocean basin where you have significant number of values that approach 20. Oxygen. The oxygen supply. The deep ocean has hy hypoxic regions, especially, for example, the Indian Ocean, portions of the Pacific Ocean. Not so, not so much, in fact, virtually none in the North Atlantic or South Atlantic. So the nitrogen supply is a slave to oxygen. So you can have all that nitrogen in the atmosphere, you can fix it even, but if you denitrify, which you do, and this isn't, you know, a thought experiment, this is empirical, you just get rid of the nitrogen. So the oceans, first of all, become nitrogen limited, the modern ocean. Second phenomenon. In order to get all that N to be fixed, you need huge amounts of iron. Nitrogenase has 38 irons in it. It's the second most iron-rich protein in nature, after ferritin, which is just an iron supply store. 38 irons per mole of nitrogenase. In the tropics, especially in a large ocean basin like the Pacific, the supply is mostly aeolian to the, to the upper portion of the water column, the tropics. You just don't get it there very much. So, I mean, Mick is working on this as we speak. It's been one of the major issues of, you know, challenging why do we have these 
these, these old, well, why, why do we have the idea that phosphorus became the limiting element in the ocean, for example? It's not even nitrogen. I, nitrogen is a slave in the interior to oxygen, but on the surface, the reason it goes like this, I th suggest is the limitation is that. Okay, so iron is limiting nitrogen fixation in the global ocean. This doesn't happen so much in lakes. Now, you can get this phenomenon in lakes big time, big time. So if you have a small lake that goes anoxic, you can have N to P ratios of three, four, five. If Redfield had been a limnologist, he would have had a totally different view of the world. And if he had worked in the Black Sea, he would have had a totally different And if he had gone, Redfield, I don't know, do you know Redfield's story? He, was, he studied the skin of frogs and how they turned color. He was an animal physiologist. So he, he, he was uh, down at OEB, what was OEB at the time, was uh, the Department of Biology at the, down at the other school, down at the other end of this, uh, this town, right? Before, and then he took a trip. He came from a wealthy family. Uh, he came from a wealthy family in Philadelphia, and he went to England, um, and he visited the Plymouth Marine Biological Laboratory in England. And Cooper, a very famous chemist at the time, even in his day, um, the Germans and the British were fighting each other for primacy of who can do the best analytical chemistry in the sea. And Cooper was an incredibly good analytical chemist working on the nitrogen supply, and, and he could measure phosphorus. Cooper showed him the N to P ratios of the English Channel were six, about 15 to 1, and he knew that the, the material that was going in was approximately 16 to 1. So, to make a long story short, if instead of visiting Plymouth, Redfield had gone to the Black Sea, to Crimea, to Sevastopol, he would have found that the interior of the Black Sea would have had a nitrate to phosphate ratio of about seven. And he never would have invented this idea. So just, just going to show the chance and contingencies and discoveries are really important. Yeah. Okay, so I know you were talking about how they were converting photochemical energy to electrical energy in the isolated system. Would that also happen when you have more, more rocks or once. You just need it w once, right? As long as you can maintain that supply. So the chance and contingency and evolution of biology is absolutely imperative. Um, I am sure, not I can't be sure, but I can speculate that there were many, many false attempts or trying to develop me metabolisms that died off, petered out. What you need is a constant supply of input of chances. So photon energy gives you lots and lots of chances. Minerals give you lots and lots and lots and lots of opportunities for repertoires. Now, what I'm interested in right now is not just, you know, we have made something very, very different from what biology does. When we make magnetite or maghematite or something like this from this, for photon energy, it's not catalytic. It's not a catalysis. It's a sacrificial system, right? Biology operates on catalysis. It has to regenerate that. So what's the smallest number of peptide linkages that I could have, or ligands, biological ligands, to make something that is catalytic? That is really a, a driving force for my intellectual progress in the next couple of years. Can I make a fivemer, a five amino acid sequence? Can I make it a very simple, intrinsically disordered protein? Can I have a cysteine, glycine, alanine, proline? Can I put something there, then, you know, very simple thing. Can I then turn that from something that just dies after a photon hits it to something that says, I'm going to react with another substrate and do that again? and again, and again, and again, even if it's low efficiency. That's really the hard part, right? That's really the hard part. So. Excellent. Do we have some more last questions? Urgency? In that case, mm. I'd like to ask one last question, uh -oh. maybe two, uh -oh. for general nature. No, nothing, something general, actually. Um, the, um, first question is going back to your oxygen correlation with nitrogen. 
So what would happen now, theoretically if the oxygen concentration we have right now would drop by, let's say, 10% or? What would happen to if it dropped 10%? Yes. Or let's say how much you would have to drop to would actually maybe start to have problems so the stability is a very interesting problem. So the mass independent isotopic fractionations tell you that once we went from one stable state, we went and in, emerged into another stable state and we never went back again. That's what it would appear to tell you, right? So once you got from a mass independent to a mass dependent fractionation, it never went and became chaotic, became mass independent and mass dependent. But, let, but we know, or at least we think we know, that there were several times in Earth's history where the ocean went, global ocean, as far as we can tell, was hypoxic. Uh, so we have ocean anoxic events in the Cretaceous at 120 million years, at 93 million years. Um, we have end Permian extinction, which is associated with global hypoxia. We have um, a Devonian extinction, which is associated with an hypoxic event. Um, we have Snowballs that are associated with hypoxic events so should be, right? At least we have carbon blackout periods that I think we, we haven't reconciled except for that. Carbon-8 blackout. Look, so look, the initial condition issue for the oxidation was the oxidation of the atmosphere. Once you keep a stable atmosphere oxidized and you don't lose the oxygen in the atmosphere, you can lose the oxygen in the ocean but get it back again by mixing. Okay? It's even a lot easier if you have terrestrial plants. So I, I don't think that, you know, you, you, the, the real problem is making <coughs> sure that you have an atmosphere that remains relatively stable. And relatively stable means it has some oxygen content that can be mixed back into the ocean. The problem for the Black Sea story was once you lose nitrogen, you can't fix as much carbon. If you can't fix as much carbon, you can't bury the organic matter. If you can't bury the organic matter, you don't get the oxygen. That's, that's the story, right? So to a, put a long story short, I think if you have oxygen that remains in a stable atmosphere, you can, keep the, the, you can lose memory of oxygen in the ocean and get it back again. At least that's what happened historically on, on this planet. Um, if you lost it in the atmosphere, then it's a totally different story. You need a mechanism to do that, but okay. So just uh, let's understand, as far as I understand, and maybe Vlada has a different interpretation for me, but a planet can only go from a reduced to an oxidized state. It can't go from an oxidized back to a reduced state. Is that fair? Yes. Unless the tectonics bring you oxidized, I mean reduced materials up to the surface big time, right? All right. Excellent. So thank you all very much. Let's okay. thank Paul again. Thank you.